Hello, BookTube. I'm Sean the Book Maniac. Welcome back to my channel. Here I am with a special series of discussions where I am shouting out BookTubers my way. I don't want to just shout them out. I want to bring them onto my channel and show them off to you. And this is one of the very first ones I've done like that. And I am introducing you to a BookTuber who's one of my favorites. She's been around for a while, but she deserves exponentially greater number of subscribers, and that's why I've brought her on here today. And she is Charlotte of Tired Mama Tries to Read. Hello, Charlotte. Hello, Sean. How are you doing? I'm okay. I'm really good. It's very sunny outside, so I'm happy with that. But you're, you're at night time, so your day is done. Uh, it's, it's, oh! The sun is still so shining. It's five o'clock here. And I got you out of bed, I hear. I hear you're a sleeper in these days. Yeah, well, I just don't feel like I have a proper schedule anymore. And at first I was trying to get up at sort of eight o'clock and then I got to teach my little boy um, Welsh because he goes to a Welsh school normally. But obviously that's not happening. So I have to be teacher. But we've decided to start our days at about 11 o'clock now and I'm, I'm happy with that. <laughs> well, thank you for getting up early for me. That's all right. No worries. <laughs> I, I think I have to share this. I said it offline. I'm going to repeat it here. My grandfather always used to say to my grandmother when he would teasingly, you know, try to coax her to get out of bed on a Saturday morning, he would say to her, Gladys, I don't know how you have the strength to lie there. So. <laughs> I'm not telling my husband that one. <laughs> so, I get breakfast in bed every day. So I'm like, that in, in itself just sort of makes you want to lie in. Like oh, there's only one day of the year where I don't, it sounds really, really lazy and it is, but there's one day of the year where I don't get breakfast in bed and that's when it's Stevie's birthday. <laughs> Lovely. So why wouldn't you lie in when you've been brought a croissant and a cup of tea? Sounds fabulous. He's a keeper. <laughs> He's a keeper, yeah. <laughs> so please tell us about your channel. My channel is Time Mama Tries to Read. And I started it probably about two years ago. Um, I am very guilty in that I didn't actually watch a lot of BookTube before I started the channel. I mostly knew about BookTube through Shan, whose channel at the time was Shani Reads, but she's now got a joint channel with her husband, Bert, and it's right. for story time. And I just really, really loved watching her. So I thought, okay, well, basically, from that day forward, I've copied everything she's done. So, <laughs> so you knew her before? We knew each other through the internet, but we'd, we'd never met. It was one of those things where I think I met her because I typed in a hashtag of an author's name on Instagram and she had read that author and hashtagged it. But when I told her that, when we had coffee last year, she said she'd never read that author and that was a lie. <laughs> <laughs> so I don't know, but I found her on Instagram and then we followed each other on Facebook and then that's how I saw that she did these videos. And I thought, oh, okay, I, I could do a video. I'll give that a go. Um, and just literally copied her format. And then all of a sudden I realized that there were quite a lot of other people <laughs> who did that as well, mm -hmm. yourself included. So I think you were one of the first five that I followed. So how long have you had your channel? I think I started it in maybe June, something like June, two years ago. Two years and, ago, okay. um, I chose Tired Mama as my little name because I had, uh, at the time, my little boy was about two and my little boy had, hasn't really slept for, well, his whole life, pretty much. So <laughs> I was constantly tired and I never had time to do any reading and I felt like the channel would be a good way for me to focus my reading efforts. And I think a lot of booktubers say that because I know Doris didn't have even that many books in her home until she started her channel. So that was kind of my aim. I thought, well, I've got the perspective of being from Wales which is quite a small kind of regional in inverted commas part of the UK and so I had access to books that maybe well I know you found interesting because that's how we found each other because you liked Welsh reading. One of my subscribers I don't remember that she's a booktuber but she knew your channel and I was talking about Welsh literature on mine and she said you must check out Tired Mama Tries to Read so I did and I contacted you I guess in a comment, and we you recommended a whole swack of Welsh lit to me, and we've done some buddy reads, and yeah, you're a very important person in my booktube world. <laughs> we had one good and one dodgy Margaret Evans, didn't we? That's right, and then one bail. I think the very first one I bailed on you. <laughs> oh God, yeah, and I thought, oh, this is it. This is it. It's the <laughs> end of the friendship. <laughs> what, what was that? It was a 19th century lesbian Welsh novel. It was. I can't remember who it. Was it Amy Delwyn? That's who it was. Yeah. 
I'm so devastated because there's like a resurgence of interest in Amy Dillwyn and I think her life is probably worth the interest you know because she lived quite an unusual life but there are like streets and pubs named after her in Swansea in the last 10 years so I was really gutted that because it wasn't good was it it just wasn't good I only read about a page I think <laughs> you know <laughs> on the bailing maniac <laughs> I didn't know at the time how much you bailed. I think I went in too innocent. Well, I'm glad that our friendship has survived. Yeah. <laughs> Although and I have to say, I'm about to bail. Well, I'm not going to bail, but I am doing, because I think you said to me, shall we bail or shall we hate read this? And I was like, what's hate reading? That's <laughs> the first thought. <laughs> but I'm reading a book at the minute with Mercedes and uh -huh. Sean. I saw you talk about it on your, was it Springathon TBR? Yeah. We are hate reading that, Sean. <laughs> I can't disguise it as anything else. And I'm sad and very worried about what people will think. <laughs> In it's, fact, that actually leads me to one of my questions that I okay. had for you. Is that when you first started your channel, I wonder, did you immediately go into being quite... Because you don't hold back. What? Yeah. <laughs> Wait, you don't hold back. And if you don't like something, you tend to just sort of say exactly what you think. But did you do that from the start or did, uh, is that something that grew? It has definitely grown, but I remember distinctly that on my very first video, which I don't want you or anybody else out there to go and watch, but my very <laughs> first video, I talked about books that I had read in the last six months that I liked. And there was one part of one book that I liked it, I liked it a lot overall, but it was almost ruined by one thing, kind of a social political thing. And I got very exercised and shouty on my very first video so yeah i kind of started that way but i've cultivated it i have to of course my subscribers know that i'm you know i, I do amp it up for the entertainment value well a bad view is very funny isn't it like that's the problem is that i kind of don't want to give too many bad reviews i'd rather almost not review i don't mind giving bad reviews when i'm sat around having a cup of coffee with somebody but i worry about i worry about the author hearing it which sounds so unlikely but I've just put a few books on Instagram and one of the authors has just shared my Springathon sure. list because she's seen her hashtag and I thought, oh my God, what if I don't like her book? <laughs> now, I relate to that anxiety completely and I think that authors need to just stand back and enjoy the publicity that they're getting from bloggers and booktubers, but stay the hell away. Don't be commenting and retweeting and stuff because I will not hold back. I mean, I... It happened recently where an author latched onto me when I, actually it wasn't even me, it was somebody else tweeted that I was enjoying the first story in her collection and then she retweeted it and she started watching my videos and it was the only good story in the book. <laughs> and I, I was really uncomfortable and I didn't hold back, but I also didn't do a rant. I just said, you know, it, the rest of it didn't work for me. It might work for others. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I didn't ever hear from that author again. <laughs> but. <laughs> but it's a modern thing, isn't it? Like, I can't imagine some of the maybe more older authors going out there and like, because I thought, well, I'm not going to at anybody because that will obviously come up on their, on their notifications. I'll just hashtag so that other readers who are perhaps reading that book can find that I'm reading that book. So they're searching their own hashtags, which I would be terrified to do. Sure. For that, for that very reason that I almost don't, I think you don't want to know. You don't need to know, maybe. I think it's a wonderful thing to do that if I'm going to give a glowing review to a book to tag the author on Twitter. Mm -hmm. But otherwise, mm -hmm. I don't follow authors on Twitter. I just want to have a lot of distance so that I can express my opinions. And there's so many aspects to this topic. It's a great topic. We could talk for a couple hours about it, about <laughs> giving negative reviews in general. And I am a big believer in giving negative reviews. They're very subjective. A lot of the books that I hate, a lot of other people love. Of course, that's built into it. But if I don't know what you hate, and I'm not saying you, Charlotte, but anybody that I watch on BookTube, if I don't know what you hate, I don't really trust what you tell me you love. Yeah, that's true. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I wonder if uh, when it comes to uh, that idea of putting out negativity, but it's not negativity. It's just how you interpreted the text and how it felt to you. And I often feel that when I do a negative review, I definitely lose followers 
on negative reviews. I don't know if you feel that. That's another question to come to you. But I also feel that tons of people, and actually Mercedes is saying this in our Voxer chat, tons of people come out of the woodwork and say, I didn't like it either. And they obviously felt too scared to say it before then. Yes, I think that it, maybe it balances out. Maybe I lose more followers than I gain, but I get a lot of appreciation from my subscribers for mm -hmm. calling it as I see it. Even from people who said, I absolutely love this book, but I love your rant too, <laughs> right? So, <laughs> Is there a particular book that you've reviewed that was too precious for your audience and they got very annoyed with you, particularly for a negative review? The one that I've had the most feedback on was The Crawdads, something The Crawdad Sings. I haven't read that one. I did watch your review and yeah, <laughs> I'm not buying it. Let's put it that way. <laughs> uh, I just thought it was trash, but it's a very well-loved book on BookTube and bestseller. And, you know, I think it went quite high in the BookTube rounds and I just thought it was crap. So I acknowledged what I thought was done well. The nature descriptions and stuff were done well, and it started out pretty good, and then I just, I hated the rest of it, and I was very forthcoming in my criticism. And that has been one of my videos that has got the most downvotes, and people expressing their disagreement, but I also think it was one of my best reviews, so. And since then, that book has come out as being quite controversial because Hasn't the author been criticized for stealing somebody else's story and perhaps not living by the values that she claims I to live by? I seem to remember hearing a bit about that, but I didn't ever investigate it. So interesting. Well, there you go. I think you just you just did the world a favor then. <laughs> I hope so. Shall I tell you what book I'm about to come yeah. down hard on? Oh, uh, yes, because uh, I think I know, but tell us what which one? It's this one, The Salt Path. And didn't you say on your TBR video that it was your parents' favorite read of last year? Yeah. So your parents I mean, are going to disown you. Yeah. <laughs> like, I, if I give something to my dad, for example, and he says it was awful, I am crushed because we've read the same books together for, you know, my whole life, pretty much. Right. And it doesn't happen very often, but every now and then he, he will just be so... Like, when I gave him Wendell Berry, I was, like, so crossing every digit that he would like it. He loved it. But they gave me this and they said, you know, we've really, really loved it. It's our book of the year. And I was like, okay. And I can see why, because the people in it are very much my parents, like generation. And they have done a similar thing to my parents. They've, they're English people who've moved to Wales and they've taken advantage of the cheap house, house prices. And they bought like a, obviously a derelict house, done it up and live in the life of Riley. But it's I just- I love that video you did about your parents' house. Tablet. Oh, thank you. That is my most viewed video. <laughs> I will link that in my show notes because people should definitely check that out. It's that and the shed. There's one where I talk about the shed, my little sort of, which I can't film in at the minute because I've got no internet reception. Because of the pandemic, all the internet services are down. So I've got very little internet in the rest of the house apart from this room, which is the bedroom and the living room. So there's no shed video, sorry. So they've lived that lifestyle. I think that's why they may be related to it. And I've seen a lot of people that have commented, have obviously felt kind of moved by the story, which is meant to be about them being made homeless and the husband being diagnosed with a terminal illness in the same week. Ooh. And they decide to walk a coastal path, a 600 mile coastal path. And, you know, instead of sleeping rough, they decide to walk a coastal path, which is insane. And you'd think, oh, well, that's an amazing topic. And it is. But now Soon wait, is, is this a novel or a memoir? It's a memoir. Okay. Yeah. I think first of all, if you don't like the tone of the person, you know, narrating their life, if you pick up on a certain level of being quite snide, which is what I felt almost from the word go from Raina Wynn, who is the or a real sense of judgment of pretty much everybody but them. I think if you picked up on a little bit of that, you can't stop seeing it everywhere else. Do you know what I mean? So me and Sean and Sadie's all picked up on it, which was great because if one of us had really liked it, I think we'd be crushed by now. And then you actually find out things like they're not actually made homeless. They're given options, but they just don't take them. And they just do really quite crazy things. They go on this journey with, and they forget his meds. And then he's really like dangerously ill in the tent and everybody around him is horrible and calls them tramps. I don't want to say I don't believe it. It's starting to feel like it's not believable. Yeah, I, don't, I don't believe it. 
And that just feels awful because if someone's talking about something awful that's happened in their life, you just sort of program to believe that that is word for word true. But it could be that she sort of jazzed things up a little bit, selected the certain stories that, that add to her sad story. To me, it's not a nature book. If I was shelving this in the bookshop, it would be in the misery memoir section. <laughs> Well, you're preaching to the choir here because I just can't get along with memoir, period. And my bail, my video went live as we started talking. I bailed on a memoir for my, what is it? Springathon. And it was yeah. Bird's Art Life. And I just, I can't get past the navel gazing yeah. of memoir. And I mean, my friend Lindy said, Sean, that's what a memoir is. Like, yeah. hello. <laughs> but, oh. I just it made it was making me ill so i bailed while i was listening to it on audio this morning on my exercise bike and selected a new audiobook to try while i was still in the same little 10 minute exercise <laughs> <laughs> i like it. maybe you sort of following the philosophy of a lot of native americans don't like the idea of memoir because they they it's sort of culturally and it's sort of uncouth to talk about yourself so it's quite unusual to have a Native American, well, it would have been, and they've become more common in the last 10 years, I'd say, but it's definitely a sort of, well, why would you just talk about you? Yeah. It, it should be about everybody. And I think maybe it, there's a drive in the person that wants to write a memoir to think of themselves as the center of their narrative. And that if you're gonna like a memoir, it's from that rare individual that is writing for a larger purpose and they just sort of happen to be the glue Sure. And hey, so it's about 10 days later and I'm editing this video. What a fabulous conversation. Thank you, Charlotte. And I just got to the point where Charlotte said one of the most profound things I've heard in 2020, if not the most profound thing I've heard in 2020, to which I demurely replied, sure. Sure? It warranted stunned silence, not some piddly sure and, and i think it, it's exactly what you were saying before and what you just said putting it all together it's the tone that you take and if i feel like you're manipulating your story just to talk about yourself or elevate yourself or you're you are writing about something else but you're actually not writing about anything except yourself it drives me up the wall okay here's a <laughs> sean rant coming no i'll suppress it but like i think in my goodreads review for this book because it's ostensibly she was dealing with her anticipatory grief about her father's terminal illness through bird watching. But what I got out of it was enough about you, birdie. What about me? What do you think of me? <laughs> just, ah! it, was so, it wasn't about grief. It was just about her, her, her. And I, I couldn't stop. Well, that's what I think with the salt path. It's dressed up as a nature book and it's been shortlisted for nature prizes and, that sort of thing but the nature writing is at the very best kind of average you know there's a lot of I've looked up the sediment of this landscape and I'm going to describe it to you but I'm not actually looking around at the time this is something I did later on at the laptop when I realized I was meant to be writing a nature book but the stuff that you hear about at the time is how all of these backpackers they keep meeting all, all sort of laugh in their faces and she says several times how old do they think I am and it's all this me, 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 focus. When she's on this walk, she reminds you at almost the end of every, well, it seems like the end of every sort of segment, but it could be, sometimes it's every page. She reminds you of two things, that they're homeless and that her husband is dying. Right. But I don't feel like any of that is really about those two things. She's still dragging him on this 600 mile walk. Yes. He's got a, it's a degenerative brain condition that's slowly like, losing pathways to his limbs and things so he's not thinking clearly so I don't really feel like he could be held responsible for this idea to travel and she says at some points I mustn't slip into self-pity and I'm like too late too, <laughs> too late <laughs> I feel awful because it's an awful situation but I can't help it it's just not good <laughs> well I support you in your hate read or if you bail I would support that too thank you so I want to show off some books that have come into my life because of you. One of them you sent to me last year, Aww. Child's Christmas in Wales, which we bonded over this because um, when I would go spend Christmas with my aunt in California, it was for some reason it was always played on um, NPR or something because we would always listen to and it was him reading it. And it was a, a Christmas tradition in America. 
So I, I have a strong connection between this story and my Aunt Mar. And now I have this beautifully illustrated version of the story. It's yeah. so, that is the classic. There's a couple of ones, but that is the classic. And in, like, when you look at some of the pictures in there, yeah. those are streets that I walk up and down. And, like, one of the streets where his house is, I used to walk past, oh, look. Right, right, right. right. I used to walk past those places every day to work in the old house I used to live in. And there's a scene of Mumble's head, which is like these little, M Mumble's is the posh part of Swansea. And it's, you'll like this. It's, I don't know if I've told you this before, but it's called that because the land that goes like this, uh, Mumble's is apparently a French derivation for um, boobies. <laughs> so it looks, <laughs> so, and I live on the other side of that. So the other side of boobs. There's the title for your memoir. <laughs> I am honestly copywriting that right now. <laughs> and this would have been a great one to do for uh, Springathon, except that it's just too chunky. But this is one of your favorite books. Oh, that was my book of the year last That's year. It. It's called Waterfalls of Stars, My Ten Years on the Island of Skomer by Roseanne Alexander. And honestly, I think you'll like that because it's so much about Skoma and she is, it's almost frustrating how she doesn't really talk much about her and her husband and she doesn't really discuss their relationship so, that much. So it's a memoir <laughs> for Sean. But, but I have to tell you, the editor could have taken a few, few it's a very small press and it's a very large book. So I think if it had been given to a larger press, it would have been edited slightly differently because there were some little bits that got on Mercedes' nerves when we were reading it. But if you can, if you love her writing enough, you can just gloss over it because I well, think it's wonderful. I know I'm not the only one who bought it. Blame it on Tired Mama Tries to Read, and I've heard nothing but glowing reviews, so that's fabulous. And... I'm waiting for the publisher to send me some kind of present for that, mm -hmm. but they've not noticed so far, I don't think. <laughs> better get on that. And I am really looking forward to getting to this one. This one I might have to get to later this year. This was one that you strongly recommended to me. Oh, Emir Humphreys. What an amazing addition you've got. It's the best of friends. Yeah, wow, it's a... Oh, oh, I love it. That is so <laughs> retro. I love it. Why do you love this book? Emma Humphreys is really underrated in Wales, but he's more well known in America than he is here. I would say he's almost like a Wendell Berry, you know, he's trying to document communities. He tries to sort of interlock characters within like political situations. But as the series gets on, you're just totally invested in the characters. And I think it's seven books in the end, something like that. Okay, no, I had forgotten that it was a series. But the one you've got is the first one where it's the two young teenage girls. And it's quite an incredibly insightful book, a bit like Wendell Berry again. His female characters are very well drawn. If anything, it's his male characters in the first one that you're not really sure of. They seem a bit stereotypical. But when you get to when they're in university, the male character that becomes one of the focuses is so well done. And his closet homosexuality and his depression are just dealt with on such a minute and delicate level that, you, that, that maybe an untrained reader might not be able to spot it until far too late in the series that this character is dealing with those issues. But if you're reading the text for the, for the characters, I think you pick up on it in a very subtle way. It's so well done. Wow. And Emer Humphreys is still alive. He turned 100 last year. Yeah, yeah, he's amazing. I think I'm gonna make it book number 19 and start it tonight. <laughs> 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 yeah, you need to talk about that. You need to talk about your 18 books because that right. is quite. How do you do that? 18 um, books at the same time? 18 is too much, to be honest. I can handle about 12 and I'm uh, probably in my element. I don't know if it's because of this being part of the smartphone generation or being, you know, having my attention span shattered by all of the iPad, internet, all that stuff. But I do best when I read 10 pages from a book and put it down and then pick up the next book and read 10 pages and put it down and cycle through what I'm reading that way. Even if it's been a couple days or more since the last time I picked it up, something about picking up the threads of the narrative and having to maybe page back a few pages and just get back into the book imprints the book so much more deeply that it's the best thing about my reading life. However, 18, too many. <laughs> so do you ever, read a book cover to cover. Without reading another book in between? 
uh, haven't done that for years. Like, I didn't start reading a whole bunch of books at the same time until a year or two before I came on BookTube. I was on Litzy for a while, which is like a Instagram-ish app for book nerds. And at that time, I think I started reading more and reading things at the same time. So it's been at least six years since I ever read a book from cover to cover without reading anything else in between. That's amazing. Well, I, don't know. I like we are completely the opposite on that one because you know I can't barely handle two books at the same time. I have to read in like little chunks because otherwise I don't get enough time away from Idris to sort of sometimes sometimes I do read in little snatches of books because I've got him playing around me and he's interrupting. Right. But most of the time I like to say, Can I have half an hour in the shed? I'll take myself off. And if I've read that and then maybe there's been three days between reading. That might be why it is actually because of Vidris and family commitments and stuff like that and just me being quite lame. I'll end up going back to a book three days later and if it was a totally different book I think it would just be, I'd be lost. Makes perfect sense and I know that I'm the oddball in this conversation. So. I love it. No I love it. <laughs> I did uh, pick up another Welsh novel recently, The Lost Thumb by Orla Owen. Oh, wow. That's another one I don't know. Isn't that a fabulous cover? That's amazing. I'm going to write that one down as well. Imagine me recommending. Do you have any Canadian or gay male fiction to recommend to me, Charlotte? <laughs> <laughs> 2019, Lavender Publishing. Orla Owen has her own webpage, orlaowen.com. Set in a cool. small town in New South Wales. About a married couple leading isolated lives. Or maybe a brother and sister. I can't tell from the description, but I was just taken by the cover. Covers shouldn't matter, but they do, don't they? This one might have to be a Charlotte Sean buddy read someday. Oh, ooh, yes. We haven't done a buddy read for ages, have we? No, we have not. Okay, I'm putting it on the list. I'll look it up. You'll look it up. I might have to go to the bad place on the internet the amazon place <laughs> when i worked in waterstones we used to call it the jungle that was our code name for it if we wanted to be really mean about it on the shop floor we used to talk about the jungle so i might have to go into the jungle for that well, you keep, keep me posted on that <laughs> i was going to ask you oh. i'm reading something else and i don't know whether you've read i'm scared to mention it in case you have started reading it and then dnf'd it or hated it or whatever but i feel like you'd really like it okay swan song have you tried no but it's on my list i know eric carl anderson loved it i don't usually enjoy reading about celebrities or people that are real life that become fictional characters but mm -hmm. i've heard a lot of good things about that so i don't think it's going to be like a sort of life changing a search into the human soul type thing but they're way bigger than celebrities they're almost royalty in america and then that made me think of the fact that we both quite like a little bit of info on the royals a little bit yes and they're living that kind of lifestyle <laughs> truman capote is trying to infiltrate that group and he, he does it so well it's just a really subtle exploration of what drove him to be like that and what made him fascinated with these women and why he did what he did and it's just this whirlwind. It's, it's what I would consider for you maybe an escapist read if you've got heavier things going on. All right, we'll stop there. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Oh, like, what a delight. I don't do enough on my channel sort of regularly, I think. I feel like because life sometimes gets in the way, I haven't got, you know, like Mel has her Monday check-ins and you do your great Instagram with your Sunday, you know, your Sunday sentences and stuff like that. And I don't have a thing. So I feel like this lockdown means I should get a thing that I do. Um, I think you don't need any gimmicks whatsoever, Charlotte. Oh, bless you. <laughs> I'll just keep being tired. 